my talk is about uh, models for explaining human locomotion. So um, I'll mainly focus on human locomotion. I'll give also a short outlook about how that really applies to robots, or how it could be applied to robots. Um, first of all, I'd like a little bit to know to whom I'm talking, so it's a very heterogeneous group. Uh, has anyone investigated human locomotion before? So you're most, uh, mostly roboticists? Can, can you say this? Okay, so I'll uh, go a little bit more into the details of um, what humans do and a little bit less about um, technical stuff uh, that you probably don't know. Great. Um, So currently I'm working at the Lauflabor uh, under the Cyphers Group in uh, Technical University of Darmstadt. Uh, we focus on models, mostly on very simple models, but um, despite their simplicity or because of their simplicity they are very useful. And we also, besides models, we make uh, we build robots. We build also powered processes, so where we basically combine biomechanics and robotics. And we also make human experiments where we derive our knowledge from. So these are the three main parts that you see, the hardware, the humans, and the models which connect the hardware and the humans. I was working in biomechanics since 2008. And yeah, last year I did my PhD about human locomotion and um, staying in locomotion research. And yeah, so just a little bit about my background, so it won't be focused too much on the technical perspective, but more on a, a biomechanical perspective. And the topic is human running. I'll start explaining why this is a topic that is helpful and also interesting to you. Then I will tell something about general characteristics of human treadmill running. So, for example, um, what how stable is it? Is it stable? Well, for sure, we don't fall off the treadmill, but can we put that in numbers? And what are some um, caveats you have to look at? Then we go to a linear model of stationary running, which is basically, I say, linearization around the limit cycle. Then the next point is a very interesting point, which are template models. Template models are explicit mechanical models of human locomotion, or locomotion in general, and they can, for example, serve as a reference for gait generation. The references, typically, I guess you obtain them for optimization, optimization of some cost function. Templates could provide you with an alternative reference motion, but you could also use templates to control your robots. So you have a very simple minimalistic model and your robot does exactly what that template should do. I'll give a short overview of how this goes. So this is not about how to make a robot do what the template does. It's just an overview of the idea of how it works. Okay. So let's start. So why should we use models at all? I would say everything where you can calculate something is a model. So typically you have your uh, if you have a robot that you want to control, you have your multi-body simulation. But your multi-body simulation is also um, just a model of the robot. It does not exactly what the robot do. Well, probably most of you have reached some nice motion in simulation and you want to copy it on the robot and something doesn't work. This is because it's only a model. But if you look also at regression of experimental data, let's say you have seen, okay, the human is doing this and this and I will and trying to predict what, it, what the human will do in the next step. What you build is a model. We use model of atoms, so also uh, physicists have models, and even mathematicians use models because uh, from a logical point of view, the natural numbers are a model of Peano's axiom. So everything that you can calculate with is a model. And what is very important is to select the appropriate model. I will not say that I have the right model seat because this is a very challenging task to say this is the right model. Um, I think the models are good models. And they are very reduced on the complexity. 
but um, the level of, com of complexity should be adapted to the problem that you are trying to solve. Um, and a more complex approach is not necessarily better, especially if you don't know so much about your system. So about humans, we know very little. We know the anatomy, we know that there are ner nerves, that there is a nervous system, but, well, nobody has ever tried to model the brain, because that would mean to copy a human, or what we think is a human. Um, if you look at your multi-body simulation, um, there's also a lot of simplifications. You don't model the um, um, strain of your um, rigid body limits, yeah? Rigid bodies, typically you have also um, switching components, so you have um, instantaneous impacts and then you continue with a, a other model where you have a fixed ground contact. But this is also only approximation and everybody agrees that this is a good simplification, but well, it's, it's a simplification, so reduction of complexity is what everybody does. And here we will go to the extreme and reduce it so far that we cannot reduce it any further. If we would take one piece away, our models would not be able to walk. Okay, so let's start where we stand. What do we know about humans? Let's start with a comparison of robot and human performance. Let's start with some videos. I like videos, especially after lunch. <laughs> so, um, I guess you all know, know uh, Asimo from Honda. And this robot is also able to run. After decades of research with lots of developers, they made this robot run. It's really complex to use it. I mean, all RoboCup participants know that it's complex because in RoboCup, I don't know, are there robots that run in RoboCup? No? No, yeah. So it's, it's really a challenging task and they solve it. Okay, now I'm being a little bit unfair. And, and say what humans can do. <laughs> I mean, you all know parkour? Yeah. And imagine your, your robot could do this. It's able to just want. <laughs> and continue running after that. <laughs> and on the other hand, we should not be too unfair, because back in the uh, 90s, um, you know Mark Rapert? Who knows Mark Rapert? All of you? Yeah. And they made a very nice uh, robot, which is this one. <laughs> and I guess uh, this robot can do more than most of us. Uh, well, at least making a somersault or something on a few human hands. So, um, robots can perform comparatively well, but we outperform robots by far in terms of agility, adaptability. So, if I take a backpack with 20 kilograms on my back, I need one step to adapt and just continue. It's not a problem. Uh, efficiency, of course. Robustness, so if I'm pushed somehow, I, well, I just continue walking. I make one step and I just continue walking. Or I turn around and say, you pushed me. So we are still much better than robots. And the question is, to what extent can we mimic this? Or to what extent can we hope to understand it? So human locomotion is complex and it has very many parts that play together. So it's initiated by the brain and goes down to the spinal cord and we have um, lots of nerves that activate our muscles which can some produ produce some nice walking gait. And one could say, okay, in order to make exactly what the human does, I need to copy the brain, which is not possible um, to the state of our current knowledge. But we say we exclude the model of our brain, it's too complex. Uh, we go only for reflex based gates or for something that um, at least 
only takes a lower level into account. So this is basically what you would say is a, a inner loop control. Um, there is quite some evidence that this is also hierarchically organized in humans. So you have some reflexes. This is an example of how this looks like. You have your muscle. Your muscle is connected to the bone with a tendon. And in this tendon there's a stretch organ, which is basically measuring the uh, force of the tendon. Um, it measures it, puts it back to the spinal cord, and this input is directly reflexed, as neuro neurologists would say, back to the muscles. So the brain is not involved. There's a reflex where the signal just go goes directly back without involvement of the brain. And the idea is, and there is some evidence, that there are reflexes which are switched on and switched off by the brain, or modulated by the brain. But um, that the brain is like a let's say, driver in a car, where you select the gear and you say go, and the car takes care of everything. And when we build now a model that looks like uh, this, which includes only reflexes, so it has muscles, bi biomechanical models of muscles, where the force that the muscle produces is measured, there are some reflexes involved, uh, which activates the muscles themselves, and this model is capable of producing human-like walking in a stable manner, and if you compare the muscle activation of this model with the humans, you see good qualitative agreement. So, it's quite convincing that, um, um, that we have kind of an autonomous walking subsystem. So, throughout the rest of my talk, I make, the, I make the assumption that there is a comparatively autonomous walking subsystem that is merely steered by the brain. And I say, okay, I'm looking only at that autonomous subsystem, and what the brain does is, well, I don't care about. And actually, this is an implicit assumption in most locomotor research. It's not often stated, but it's a Okay. So. Yeah. So this is now, uh, I'm presenting now a video, and there's something I have to explain what's happening there before, uh, before we see the video. So, um, in this video, the treadmill broke down. So this subject is running on, on a treadmill, and the subject steps on the treadmill, and the treadmill instantaneously stops. The subject does not fall, but also stops immediately. But um, This is something um, which is remarkable. But I would say this is out of the scope of simple models because um, you have to take the adaptation that the brain does into account, is my opinion. What's interesting to see is um, If you see, the subject is, going with a, is standing with a green leg on the ground, and the green leg goes into air again, so there's a lift off again. So um, it seems that there's a, some um, predefined motor command in the leg that says, okay, touch down and push me back into air again, which is still executed, but nevertheless, the next leg is already adapted to just stand and don't do anything. There's also much more flexibility than just walking and running that we have. So, from the versatility of human motion, but I think we would all be proud if we would have robots who could do this. Also, I'm not sure.
Okay, so um, I will talk about two kinds of models. One kind of model are the Floki models, which are basically a linearization around the limit cycle. And the other kind of models are template models. So Floki models are <coughs> data driven. That is, we put the human on the treadmill, we let the human run, we analyze what the human is doing, and then we use uh, or we'll build a model from the data where which hopes that the model exhibits the same behavior as the human does. And one could say, um, by construction, up to the first order, this is guaranteed. It's a very generic model, so if you have an asymptotically stable motion, you can build this kind of model. On the other hand, it's quite abstract, so um, it's not easy to implement in hardware because it does not tell you, I will need a leg with this configuration or I will need uh, this kind of controller, you don't know. Maybe some words about the general, um, about how this blocking model looks like. So we say we have a periodic motion. And so we say there is a limit cycle. If there would be no disturbance, humans would converge to that limit cycle. There are also intrinsic disturbances, so nervous noise, for example. So this is why we don't observe a limit cycle, but we say the average motion is our limit cycle, which is here in. Uh, lab. So it's a zeroth order approximation. Around that, we build a linear model, which is basically we take linear maps from one section to another section. And we could also build a return map, which is basically I start from here, go once around the limit cycle, and if I start here, where would I be after one cycle? This is the return map. We can quantify the eigenvalue of this return map which gives us a number of stability and it's, well, it's independent where it takes a section. The nice thing is that we get eigenmodes according to each eigenvector of the map which uh, propagate independently. So here are the red and the blue curve um, exemplarily show the propagation of um, eigenmodes of the system. Okay, the other kind of model is a so-called template model. Um, I will come to what template means later. Template models are highly reduced models and they are explicit mechanical models and they are intuition, intuition driven. So they are not primarily data driven, they are intuition driven and that could look like this. So we start from our model and we see, well, we can take lots of things apart and we get a certain motion and can we, get, can we find a simpler system that does almost the same thing and the answer is, you can take almost everything away. We have one point mass with two massless springs, and this thing shows comparatively human-like walking, which is impressive given that this model is really so simple. Okay, so let's come to the real data. I'll talk about um, human treadmill running experiments where we've seen uh, the treadmill which broke down before in the video. And this is like how our experimental setup looked like. We have an instrumented treadmill which is able to measure the forces, ground reaction forces. We have a motion capture system where you see cameras here and here, where we put reflective markers on the subject on prominent anatomical landmarks where we can really measure um, how the subjects move. But again, here's a model assumption that we say, we put our markers at certain positions, but it's not sure that we really capture all the motions. Think of your uh, stomach. It's not measured how it moves compared to your uh, skeleton. And this is uh, actually, it's not uh, negligible. This mass. We can only hope that it's moving in phase. It's not necessarily the case that it does move in phase. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we have to think about how we can compensate uh, these errors, or if they are important. And yeah. so we have two important, we have lots of processing steps. But I want to highlight two of them. First is that we um, use a complementary filter to um, compute the center of mass motion, and we 
are pretty confident that uh, the accuracy from step to step is uh, far better than one millimeter that we have. Um, later on we will focus on the center of mass motion. So good reference data is really important on the one hand. On the other hand, um, if you look at running or walking, actually walking is not a periodic motion. Because what you do is you progress. So your motion is periodic in most coordinates, but not in all. So if you take your kinematics with respect to the center of mass, then you get a periodic motion. And so here again, a reference, which is in the case of center of mass, should be um, of high quality. Um, the second important, important point for the Floki models is to compute the phase properly. Um, one could think, well, phase, it's from touchdown right leg to touchdown right leg is 2 pi and that's all. Um, and I would challenge this assumption because let's say you're running and then there's a stone that you didn't see so you're touching down much earlier than you actually intended. According to your original definition, your gate cycle ends here and your 2 pi is compressed to a shorter time phase. So um, your motion, which was on the limit cycle before, is now off the limit cycle and even the step before because your touchdown is too early. So you somehow need a better phase estimate. And um, yeah, I'm not going into the detail, but there's a. I would also say that the phase estimate is here very reliable. This is um, important for the results. We have also made let's say naive phase computations and we get qualitative differences in the results especially also in the eigenvalues one important point about human running is um, is it stationary? so the humans are su supposed to run on the treadmill there's, it's really boring so the human is running on the treadmill for about half an hour and there's no change in the lab they should just run. So a robot, if the robot is properly constructed, might perform stationary in the sense that it would find a limit cycle or would do the same step 1,800 times. Will, do, will humans do the same or won't they do it? First question. Second question is, um, could the dynamics be modeled by an AR1 process? Which is basically, um, is our fluke structure justified? Look at structure is the linearization around the limit cycle. So um, before we actually come to the Fluke model, is it allowed to use these models? And so first, let me talk about how we investigated the stationarity. We resampled our data to 50 frames per sprite. So one sprite is two steps. So we have uh, 25 samples for one step which is, well, include most information, but is certainly not too high, uh, not too much of a sample. And we select 15 representative coordinates. So a coordinate is uh, typically a difference between two measured markers, or a marker at the center of mass, um, which is slightly better than, for example, joint angles. Um, yeah. and 15 coordinates. For a state space model, we also need the corresponding velocities. So we have 30 dimensions. So a complete stride is defined by 1,500 scalar quantities. 30 dimensions in 50 frames is 1,500 scalar quantities. And we can think of it as one point in our 1,500 dimensional stride space. So I can say this point is stride number one and stride number seven is at this point. And now, to investigate if it's um, stationary, I just look at the principal components of this space. The idea is that I compress all these continuous data to five numbers per step, which I know give me the most information that I can get from linear methods. Okay, so the first axis of the principal, principal components covers the most information about my measure of stride. And this is how it looks like. So please remember that every point 
here is one sprite. And the black vertical lines are every four minutes of measurement duration. So from here to here is four minutes. So that you get a rough feeling about the time. And you see that it's not stationary. You could run statistical tests, it's not stationary, but you really see it. Um, it's not only the big, very slow drift up here, it's also, for example, if you look at principle component number five here, for a couple of steps, it's clearly above the baseline. Or um, if you compare um, the, mean, the average value here with the average value here, you see that there is a clear um, difference. Uh, so human motion, unfortunately, is not stationary. If you have a non-stationary process, you know uh, that cannot be an AR1 model. We see that we have order changes in the order of minutes. Yeah. So, so what's the reason for that? Is that fatigue or boredom, or why why would that change for for the human running? Uh, that's a very good point. It might be a combination of everything. So, I think here at the beginning, at the first minutes, from here to here, we have three minutes. It might be that the subject gets used to the treadmill. Or, or yeah, getting used to it. Yeah. yeah. Um, it also might be fatigue. Also, we took trained runners, but they also had fatigue. And it's also that the subject yeah, got bored and started uh, talking to the investigator. So, what do you do this evening? And these are changes which are, no, yeah, boring something which is part of the brain. So. Because it happened, like I used to do a lot of these tests when I was still on the speed skating team. Mm -hmm. And uh, you do get bored when you run the treadmill for a long time. Yeah. And so then you try and run like at the front part and then you run at the back part a little bit. So anything yeah. to break the boredom. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at the first graph on top, there's a correlation between all these vertical uh, uh, lines. So there must be a clock in the room or do you know what I mean? Yeah. So the, these peaks are always at the four minutes. This year, mine. Ah, yeah. Um, um, was there a signal in the room? Or? Yeah. Um, due to technical reasons, we had to, um, this data are not continuous. So there's a short break of 30 um, seconds or up to one minute here. We had to stop, to stop, stop our measurement. The subject um, ran all the time during the measurement. So the subjects ran continuously, but they said, okay, well, no, okay. Um, we don't record now, and so they, we talk to them during these breaks. So there's a break of one minute, and, and we talk to them, so I think this is a reason for this jump here. So what we do is, um, we say, okay, we have um, our limit cycle changes from time to time. So we assume that we still have a limit cycle, that, that limit cycle changes with time. And mathematically speaking, we do a detrending with a, um, a 61 frames moving average. So that about uh, 40 seconds, say for 40 seconds, we have approximately the same baseline, which is, um, um, I think it's a good compromise because if you do too hard detrending, let's say five or 10 strides detrending, you might actually remove parts of your short-term dynamics. And I think with 60 strides, um, you don't remove the short-term dynamics. So to summarize, um, unfortunately we don't have stationary data, and if the data are not stationary, we cannot use um, a Floki model to describe the data. But because we don't have a better approach, we still use them, Detrain the data and say, okay, let's go for a local model. It still captures a lot of the variance, and let's see how far we get. That's the idea. And now we look at these floating models. So, as I said before, um, the floating model analyzes the motion around the limit cycle. So, we say, our black line is now our average motion that we have over, over 60 sprites. And we select Poincare sections. We take different selections, so I don't say which atom. 
selected um, because we, yeah, we made several choices and most of them broke. Uh, so concrete resection is basically a section uh, transverse to the limit cycle, which is this one is a concrete resection, and this one is also a concrete resection. And we compute from our measured data the mappings from one section to the next section. So I say, if I am here, what is my expectation value on the next concrete section? And we take an ordinary least squares approach to compute these to get our maps. In order to get return maps, we have two choices. We could either say, okay, this is my first concrete section, and the next concrete section is one cycle ahead. So the same section, but too high ahead in phase. Alternative, yeah, I could say, okay, I take one section here, one section here, one section here, I compute the mapping from here to here, or from here to here, and from here back to here. That would also give me a return map. You might argue, okay, um, there's a technical detail. If you have a 64 dimensional subsystem selected of your kinematics, you lose one dimension because you have a limit cycle, so you somehow need to subtract this dimension. Um, but from a mathematical point of view, that will give you an eigenvalue of exactly one in the regression, and so we just skip this. Okay, it's a technical detail. We are now interested in what are the eigenvalues of these maps, which is basically how stable is my system. And in literature you see that, um, from depending on the publications, you get very different eigenvalues, and so eigenvalues are not really reliable to compute. And in order to account for this um, problem, we applied the, boost, the bootstrap procedure, which is a very nice statistical procedure I would like to explain, because um, some of you might want to use it. The idea is that you get a confidence interval for everything you can compute from data. You have measured data, you want to compute something, and you need a confidence interval, and you don't know how to get the confidence interval, then you almost surely, almost certainly can use this procedure. So first step is you select a random subset of the data, which has the same length as the data, so it's resampling uh, with repetition. Then you compute the quantity of interest, in this case, we compute the eigenvalues. And then we take another randomly um, subset of the data, we compute the same quantity, and then we look at the distribution of the, of the quantity. And the bootstrap says that the distribution gives you a confidence interval of the um, true value under certain assumptions. And in our situation, we are interested in the distribution of the eigenvalues. So how accurate are the eigenvalues that we get from the data? And we have the return of 45 dimensional states, 45 eigenvalues, plus one which is zero. And the results look like this if we compute it for a single map. So I, ta I take one concrete section, I compute the maps that predict my data two steps ahead. Uh, so phase two pi ahead, and this is the eigenvalue distribution. So first thing that we see is there are no large eigenvalues. So it's stable, great. So one over e is so the order of magnitude of the largest eigenvalues, which is not too bad, I would say. Um, we also can compute the diameter that we expect from pure noise. So we could say, well, all you, all you measure is noise. That could be an explanation for low eigenvalues. But in this situation, we would get, or we would expect something this diameter. OK. So we have very good stability, but also a high noise floor. So you can say, OK, this is my eigenvalue here. Maybe here and here are distinct eigenvalues. Hard to say something about this. But if you now take three concrete sections, and I take as a return map, the matrix product of all three maps, then I get this eigenvalue distribution, which is much better, much uh, more focused, 
And you see it's somehow similar to the original one. Uh, please note that here we have a 1 over e circle and here we have a 0.5 circle. So that here and here we have uh, these um, we have these eigenvalues. So there seems to be something where we, which we might be able to recover. And here, well, it's a comparatively large eigenvalue. We have to see. Uh, we will see later that this is not related to running. It's, I don't know exactly what it is. It's maybe post row stability where I put my elbow somewhere. It's not related to the running motion itself. data were collected from a person running stable on a treadmill? Yes. So this is for a single person. If you have a different person, the eigenvalues look very different. Uh -huh. So there were no disturbances in my guy. So we actually don't really know how large the, the basin of attraction would be because it wasn't that. We just know that one person walking stably produces these eigenvalues. Yes. Um, that's true. It's currently we don't know um, how our results would look like if we introduce disturbances, uh, and it might turn out that the eigenvalues that we get are very different. In terms of that, then we would activate some reflexes which are not activated here. We have um, a certain amount of variability, and we assume that we have a noise-driven system which is asymptotically stable. And yeah, the next steps are, of course, to investigate that for disturbances. We have, actually, we have um, collected data from a treadmill uh, with variable ground floor uh, height. So there's a treadmill with a belt with um, different ground heights, so in quadratic plates on the, on, the, on the belt. And the subject is walking on that plate and also walking on the, on the same treadmill without these variable ground height. And we haven't yet started the analysis of this data, but this is certainly the next steps. Mm -hmm. um, we also had a look at the data to see if the magnitude of the variance is large enough so that we are not only regressing noise, but it's really substantial variability. And yeah, to the best of our knowledge, it's really enough variability in there. there will be a result that really confirms this assumption that I just said. So, um, we've seen that human motion on the treadmill, human running is really stable, but um, we could not really recover the eigenvalues very well. And we, we now make a complementary approach, which is we try to predict the motion, which is also based on the Floki model. So we take our maps and we try to predict the motion a certain phase ahead. So this is our model that we have to say, starting from our phase uh, big phi, um, we want to know at, uh, at phase phi, okay. um, at some phase ahead, we want to know how our state will be, given that our phase, our old state was x some phase ahead. And we have a, a linear mapping, which is phase dependent. And we also know that there is some noise driving our system. So this is our general model assumption from which we know that it's not completely true because um, the, this kind of motion cannot produce a trend that we observe. But we say, okay, it's the best assumption that we have. And of course, we are only interested in the state around the limit cycle, not in the limit cycle itself. And the quantity of interest is the, is the remaining variance. So, I have a state with a certain variance, difference from the limit cycle square, and I have a certain prediction from my model. And I compute the variance of the state minus the prediction and compare it to the variance that I have without the prediction. So that tells me how much of the motion can I predict in a single number. And what I should mention is that we made an out of sample prediction. So uh, we take some part of the data, compute the return map, and predict these data that we have not taken um, for the regression, which is important because, um, yeah, to, to avoid overfitting of the data. 
this is our prediction result. And I need some time to explain this result. So our gate cycle has 50, sec has 50 sections. So here number of sections ahead means 50, 50 sections ahead is here I am predicting one stride ahead. And zero means actually I'm predicting just the next um, just the next uh, phase um, sections. So roughly um, um, one um, roughly ten milliseconds or something to the order of magnitude. And uh, we see so going vertically means going forward in time with my prediction. And we see that for very short times we have very good predictions. So our variance of the prediction is very small. That means we don't have too much measurement noise compared to the variance of our data. And we also see that if we go ahead in time, we can predict less and less and less and less of the data. After one stride, we can predict, well, something about 5% of the variance, which is almost nothing. But after one step, which is here, there is still a substantial amount of the variance that you can predict. And on the horizontal axis, I have plotted this for different starting sections. So it might be that the result is only valid for one, for one section, which is not the case. So you can select any point of your gate cycle and start your prediction, and the qualitative result is almost everywhere the same. And to get a more, um, to get an information, which phase number corresponds to which time in the gate cycle um, I have plotted the vertical ground reaction forces here. So here's the touchdown. Here's the takeoff. So here's the flight phase, and you can say, okay, at the beginning of the flight phase, I can predict um, one stride one into the future goes comparatively well, one step, one stride almost all information is lost. So, to make a long story short, we have one stride deadbeat behavior. Not single step, but single stride deadbeat in human running for small disturbances. Okay, to come to the conclusion of the linear analysis of human treadmill data is we are very stable runners. Our disturbances vanish after approximately one stride. Af explicitly after one step, there is some variance that can still be predicted. This is something we will come back later on with it, and we should remember this. Okay, so before I come to the template models, are there any questions regarding um, this linear analysis? Yeah. Well, two steps sounds actually really good. That means that the linear model is uh, fitting the data so well. What's the conclusion to be made from that? You mean that we have covered comparatively long prediction? Yes. Uh, two steps sounds good to me. Do you think that it's, it's not it's not very far into the future? Well, there's a certain trade-off. Um, being able to predict something uh, to the long future means that you are not that you are not very stable. So um, I would say two steps is quite stable, and I would say also that the um, that the linear model is has uh, sufficient complexity in, in terms of that um, with higher order models we would not be able to capture more. Is that is the answer to your question? Yes. You understand, right, that there might be a lot of bifurcations in, in the movement? Um, in human... Uh, what exactly do you mean by bifurcations? Yeah. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, so we assume that our model is driven by noise. So um, the non-determinism comes from the noise. Um, you think so? You think so? Yes. 
we know from um, yeah, biomechanical analysis that there is a lot of noise in the nervous system on the one hand, and on the other hand that humans intentionally induce variability to exploit the reactions of their own system, so to constantly learn their system. So, um, in order of a better model for this intentionally induced disturbances, you say this is noise. Uh, does it answer your question? No, I think so. Okay, but we can come to that yeah. later. Um, maybe one point, if you think about this 5 or 10 percent variance that we can get, and we think about that the largest eigenvalues are roughly in the order of 1 over E. Um, one can make a quick estimate and see that this is um, actually a consistent um, behavior if you have a noise problem. So now uh, let's come to the really interesting things and from my point of view, where I have worked a lot with, these are template models. These are explicit minimalistic mechanical models that reproduce human gait. So the motivation is linear models don't tell us about how this gait is actually created. So they don't tell us um, you need um, this leg function, you need this uh, force in the leg, you need um, if you want to construct a robot, you need these elements that don't tell us anything about this. And, yeah, this is why explicit models are nice. On the other hand, you might go terribly wrong with the wrong assumptions in these models. But, yeah, let's just see how far we can get. And we require that both the template models and the humans have the same have the same behavior. With behavior, I mean reaction to disturbances. So, I would like to know uh, the term template model. This is very common in biomechanics, um, but not so common in roboticists. For roboticists, so who has heard about template models before? Okay. So templates. Can, can I just ask about? Yeah. Can you more closely define what similar behavior means? Because if yeah. you look at two people walking, they could walk very differently, and if you give them a shove, they'll react. You know, one person might fall over, but one person would stay upright. So what exactly do you mean by similar behavior? Um, here with similar behavior, we refer to the same eigenvalues, because uh, the idea is that um, um, Eigenvalues describe how the system evolved this time. If two systems have the same eigenvalues, then there is a coordinate transform under which the one system looks exactly like the other one. So we say, if you look at the return maps of our humans and of our models, we want to have the same eigenvalues in both. And templates started without the name templates. Um, <coughs> They started actually in the 19th century. That uh, the spring mass model uh, that I will use here started in uh, yeah, 1990, 1989. And the spring mass model consists of a point mass and a linear massless spring, which describe human center of mass behavior. So if you take the spring mass model, which is also called slip model for spring loaded inverted pendulum, this is why here is mesh. Uh, we, all, we are only interested in the center of mass dynamics. Uh, there's a certain reasoning behind it because the center of mass dynamics are under-equated in human motion. In human motion, you can um, you can um, separate the motion into motion of the center of mass and motion of the segments around the center of mass. Then the only thing that is not that you cannot control is the motion of the center of mass and okay, the total angular momentum. But you can regulate a lot of things during flight. So for example, you can make a, I don't know, on your um, elbow joint or on your knee joint a position, you, you could make a high gain PD control and follow every joint trajectory that you want, but you cannot make your center of mass follow every trajectory that you want. So this motion of the center of mass is an important quantity, and this reduced model focuses on the motion of the center of mass only. And and this model can reproduce 
experimental data very well. So the black curves here represent measured data. So um, this is the vertical center of mass height over time. And the model simulation was started here at this apex, which was not shown. And the model is running forward. There's no reset at apex here involved. We just have searched for the right parameters. Um, we will see in the tutorial how that works. But if you can't find the right parameters so that the model has almost the same vertical motion, a very similar horizontal motion as well, and also very similar ground reaction forces. And these ground reaction forces were not subject to any optimization. And what is also very important for several parameters of the gate cycle. So the apex height, the total step duration, the horizontal velocity and running direction. We have an exact match between the model and the experiment at every apex. So we can really say we reduce our motion to only the parameters of that model. I will come to that model later. First, a little bit more general what templates are. Um, the templates and anchors hypothesis was proposed in 1999, which basically states moving animals and moving men have very com are a very complex system. We have lots of actuators, we have uh, lots of joints, and we could use in a very complex way, but we don't explore all our possibilities. For our typical motions, we behave like very low dimensional systems. So we don't have to analyze highly complex motions. It's sufficient to analyze highly reduced models. This is a central hypothesis. And templates are these minimalistic models that focus on the selected functionality. The idea why they are called templates is, is that they are not only valid for humans, but they are also valid for, let's say, horses or cockroaches or whatever animals you think for bouncing gates. And so they are all derived from the same template if you want to think of it like this. So let's look a little bit closer at this very minimalistic model, the spring-loaded inverted pendulum. You've seen the excellent match with the center of mass dynamics before. And so nice thing is that we don't have to measure or to, to measure a continuous data to store a continuous trajectory. Our stride or our step is represented by the initial conditions and five quantities, five parameters of the model. These five parameters are the leg spring <coughs> constant, the rest flex of the spring, the um, orientation of the leg during flight. So we say during flight at apex, the leg is positioned at some value, at some uh, orientation, and we wait until we have touched down, and then we have a massless spring which our body yeah, bounces on. There is a fifth parameter which is not displayed here, because humans change their energy from step to step. And we allow that at the nadir event, which is a minimal vertical position, the spring rest length and the spring constant may change to allow an injection or remove of energy. So our model is not energy preserving. And you might think, well, okay, nice simple model, what can you do with it? Does it have any benefit? And yes, it has. Besides that we can use it for uh, robot control, as I will tell a little bit about later. Uh, we can make three approaches using these models for understanding human locomotion. One is we can analyze the model itself. What, what are the features of this system? And then we can derive hypotheses from that system and test them on the human. The other approach is we can analyze the corresponding template. So we have a highly reduced view of the system and then we analyze only this reduced um, model. We will do this also. 
and the third thing is we can build up on these models. So let's say we have a good walking model. We have found a model that, that creates nice walking gates that are very stable and look human-like and we can go to everywhere that we, that we want. We need one uh, hundredth of a millisecond to compute uh, our desired parameters to go somewhere. Nice model, but it only has a point mass. We don't have a trunk. How can we stabilize a trunk when we have this walking model? Can we do this? The answer is yes. We can add more complexity to, to that model and inherit the nice behaviors of the underlying base model. This we will also see how that goes. Okay. And I see I have to hurry up a little bit. The one example of a testable hypothesis derived from the spring mass model is that um, there is no single step deadbolt controller. For a perfect deadbolt controller, you need two steps. Um, this is also very um, clear. Um, if you think of a lane, lane change maneuver. So, for example, we look now um, from the back to our running human. Our running human is now a point mass which runs perfectly in line into the direction of the whiteboard. But now the human wants to run on that lane here. So, how or what's the only way that the human can achieve this? So, in a first step, let's say the human is in flight, in a first step, the human has to put his leg here, which will result in a motion over here. In the next step, the human puts his leg here, and if you ch take the right angles here, select the right stiffness parameters, um, then at the second step, um, you will run perfectly in line into that direction here. And I think it's intuitive, intuitively clear that there is no solution that can do that in one step. For other requirements, there are single step damage controllers. So the capture point is one example of this, where you, your goal is just to stop. I want to stop. I don't care where I stop, I just want to stop. Then the answer is just put your leg at that place, make it completely rigid, and you will stop. This is basically the short version of capture point. And um, in contrast to the lane change maneuver, in the capture point, the, the requirement is not to stop at a certain position in space, but just to stop. So your, your constraints are less dimensional. And if you think of this, um, Argumentation here is quite general. So, if, if you think that our human runner has only a very narrow foot, we could say the argumentation is also valid for humans, not only for slip. And the testable hypothesis is that humans have a two step dead bit control and da da. Yeah. Good agreement, very nice. It was predicted by Carver 2009, we found it uh, last year, and so we can say, well, at least there is some relation. But the next thing is, from the slip analysis, we know now, we know, know that there is no controller that could do better. So increasing your P on your controller, on your robot, will not help you. And this is what we learned from the models. Yeah? Can I ask you a question about it? I didn't quite understand. I thought this data shows how far you can predict the future state of the running human. Yes. And it states that you can predict it approximately two, two steps into the future and then you don't know anymore. Yes. So predicting the state is a different thing from controlling the state. Yes. The idea is um, we have a noise driven system. And a noise driven system has um, two parts. It has a deterministic part. And it has a yeah, random part. And the only thing that you can predict is a deterministic part. And if you have a, a dead bit controller, or close to dead bit controller, um, that has a certain amount, needs a certain amount of time for the dead bit, then we can predict 
until the depth controller has uh, um, cancelled out the disturbance. So when we say we are able to predict it for about two steps, then we say after two steps, the, um, the predictable part of the dynamics is lost, and all that is now off limit cycle dynamics is noise, which is not or which was not included in the initial state. So, which is noise which appeared after our initial condition. Does that make sense? Yes. So, um, here again, um, this is a, it's a little bit different here. Um, this is how we see the dynamics when we use slip for gate analysis. So we say we have a certain state n at an apex. So we are looking always at the apex, the highest point in the flight phase. You could use also other points, but apex is very convenient. We say that these dynamics are mapped to the ne next apex using the dynamics of the slip model, which depend on the initial conditions that are given from experimental data or from the previous simulation. And also depend on the control parameters. So we have some parameters which are set by any controller. We don't know about this controller. And there's an additional noise term, which is basically, if you think of the stiffness as a leg, if you think of the stiffness of the leg um, as in physical terms, so that means the activation of your muscles. So if you have a stronger push-off, that's a higher stiffness in the model. And then you have some nervous noise um, whatever disturbances might occur, um, so your parameters are not set perfectly. This is our way of introducing the noise in the model. Yeah. And the question is now um, that we want to answer using our model, what is the input for the controller? So on what states does the control output depend? What do I need to measure to set my to set my leg properties? Also, if I want to build a robot that runs human life, I don't say that this is necessary necessarily the thing that we want to do here. Uh, we could maybe do better motions, but if you want to have a human life, what do we need to measure to find a controller that makes the same as humans? Do? So we are now interested in identifying the input of our control. And what we do is we make a prediction test. What input is required for the optimal prediction? So we make linear regression on the parameters. We know that we can compute the parameters so that our model exactly follows the measured experimental uh, COM trajectories until infinity. So we know that, our, that knowing our parameters is where we want to go because they determine the motion. And we want to see what do we need to predict these parameters. The possible input candidates are full kinematic state. So I know everything that I can measure this is basically my reference because I don't have any further information. Maybe except full state of the apex and full state of the apex before because it might be that we use our memory, might also be the case. It might also be that slip is self-contained. So I just need to know the center of mass state, which is part of slip anyway, and it takes the slip parameters from the previous step, which are also known as slip simulation. And another state uh, is, more for testing, center of mass state plus full upper body markers. So the question is, um, do my upper body markers really influence the way I move? Is it really connected? Or, which I would really like, is can I find an uh, low-dimensional running subsystem which only takes information from, let's say, feet and center of mass into account and does not care about the upper body and does exactly the same as humans in terms of eigenvalues? Oh, I forgot the mistake. Yeah. So here we make again our prediction. <coughs> so we predict our slip parameters, compare them with the true values, 
in the experiment and see how much is our variance reduced by the prediction. Um, this is data for all six subjects. So for individual subjects, these confidence intervals are much smaller. This is because there is a high variation between different subjects. And smaller is better. So if you would be here, we could predict the parameter completely. And if you would be here, we cannot predict the parameter at all. And what we can see is that our reference, full body state, can predict most parameters for one step quite well, which is also what we would expect. We see that if we take the um, full state of the last apex additionally into account, our prediction actually gets a little bit worse. This is because we make out of sample prediction to avoid overfitting. And then we have three additional candidates. One is um, that what we have said before here in red center of mass plus upper body, which performs remarkably worse than our uh, reference. Slip plus previous slip parameters, which are also not very good. And if you take the center of mass state and only the state of the ankles, we are almost as good as the reference. So we can say, okay, oh, cool, ankle state is our reduced model. We only need to know where our ankle position is and we can predict almost all of our slip parameters. And then we can build a reduced model. We need, we build now a reduced model which consists, or which tells us how the center of mass state evolves, and also about how the ankle state evolves. But for the ankle state we only have discrete mappings. And we say center of mass and ankle state gives us our slip parameters, we have a linear map for this. And center of mass state with an ankle state, we take a mapping to the ankle state of the next epic. So we don't have a dynamical model that tells us how does your leg move during swings. No, it's just a discrete mapping. Think of it as an uh, internal controller state. I think that's fair. And um, we can build an autonomous system now. This is important because if we don't have an autonomous system, there's no reason to uh, speak about eigenvalues of the system. And our system is only nine dimensional. And then we can compute the eigenvalues of our system. We can compare these eigenvalues with our 45 dimensional floating model. And you see, we get actually very nice agreements. So the red diamonds are the um, non bootstrap eigenvalues of our uh, forward model of human running. And below there is the eigenvalues that you can get from the return map of our, um, yeah, our um, data analysis. So we derive the controller for slip for this specific subject, created an autonomous forward model, which is a controlled slip model, and Included the eigenvalues of this model, and we see that there's actually very good agreement. We have some very low eigenvalues. We have two or a pair of complex conjugates, which are yeah. very close uh, to the observed ones. And we also see that this one here has nothing to do with the motion of the center of mass, something completely unrelated. I, I, I want to ask a question. So, uh, on the one hand, you are happy that you explain uh, certain uh, eigenvalues there, and then the other one uh, that you don't explain, you say, well, this doesn't have anything to do. So, uh, could you also say, well, this is a major shortcoming of my model that I didn't explain this? Um, I would say, because um, here we are only interested in the center of mass dynamics. There is also, for example, the angular momentum. Or we could think about, I don't know, um, the lateral spreading of my arms. So when I say, okay, now I go like this, and I just slowly relax my arms laterally, that is maybe not related to the dynamics of the center of mass. So um, our model is only intended to explain the dynamics of the center of mass that we observe. 
and we say that there are additional motions. We don't explain the full motion, but we say there are additional motions which we neglect. So, yeah, the, the, I think the main question is, uh, is it important or not? Yeah. So you neglect certain things, but uh, is this like essential or? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a very good question, and I would say that up to what you want to achieve. So when you want to have a robot that does exactly like the human, but doesn't have any arms, then, um, and let's assume that these eyewings are related to the arms, then you have to ignore them also on your robot, because if, if you don't have arms, you cannot do the same motion with the arms as the human does. But you could do, uh, you could achieve um, the re remaining eigenvalues. But if you say, okay, well, I want to do exactly what the human does, including the arm motions, then you would also have to, um, to, fit a, to find a model that also would include this eigenvalue here. Yeah, but who knows if it's the arm, so it could just be that the mass is not uh, concentrated in one point, but has some elongation, so it has uh, some moment of inertia. Uh. Yes, um, th this is also another point, so this model does not care about the moment of inertia, especially the angular momentum and all, all this stuff. Um, there is a part of the dynamics that we, that, that we neglect, but um, intentionally we wanted to investigate only the dynamics of the center of mass. So, and we want to find this is also important an autonomous subsystem that explains the dynamics of the center of mass. And for and um, the, what we learned here is that this eigenvalue. So there is a Floki mode that is um, uh, corresponding to this eigenvalue. This mode is not related to the dynamics of the center of mass. But that there is some independence of the motion. Okay, so um, an inter intermediate summary of the templates is, uh, first of all, what I didn't mention explicitly is that the templates do generate gates. So instead of just saying, okay, this is your reference limit cycle, we have a reference gate. We could, adjust, we could adapt our parameters, get a slightly different gate. The limit cycle itself is an output of the dynamical system, it's not predefined. Uh, we learned that SLIM is not self-contained with respect to capturing human running, so there is no linear controller that would give you the same eigenvalues um, that humans have if you only take SLIM-related information into account, so center of mass state plus previous SLIM parameters. But if you measure the angle, you can come very close to human center of mass dynamics. So, to speak that uh, with different words, if you measure only the center of mass state and the angle states, then you can find a dynamical model that is similar in terms of eigenvalues to the human center of mass dynamics and also in, um, with respect to disturbances. So uh, it will behave the same in the presence of disturbances, small disturbances. Okay, so. Yeah, to wrap a little bit. Um, we are most interested also in walking because running robots are comparatively rare. There are many more walking modes. Slip can also walk fine. So here you see the bipedal slip walking. You can also walk stably in a circle. And you see, no, you don't see. Oh, that's bad. Okay. The ground reaction forces actually are in very good agreement um, to human running. You see this typical double humped ground reaction force pattern for the vertical ground reaction force. This is also what you observe in human. So um, without going into too much detail of too much details of this model, we have already a walking template. And the idea is now to think about postural stability. So, just one way, I understand right that the center of mass is also uh, moving uh, left right. Yes, in this model. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, we now ask, um, just a few minutes before we discussed about maybe the um, angular momentum has some motion with some eigenvalues which are not captured but are comparatively high, let's say 0.5. 
and which are not part of the center of mass dynamics, but are maybe complicated to regulate. Also, the angular momentum cannot be compensated during um, um, flight in running. So, can we maybe find a nice template model that explain how humans regulate their pitch, their pitch motion? And if you look at the raw data, at a certain view, um, we see this picture. So, here we see two subsequent steps, and the center of mass is kept fixed here. So, we don't have an inertial frame here. We say our center of mass is the origin of the coordinate system. So we have an accelerated accelerate coordinate system. And we look, where does our ground reaction force start from? So it starts here. And in which direction does it point? And you see that the ground reaction forces intersect at some point above the center of mass here and here. You can calculate that point including uh, with a least squares approach. And if you take the initial impact into account the least squares, you get this and this effective point. But um, I would say these and these are the effective pivot points. Because actually what this is, it's, it's a pivot. So if the ground reaction force intersects at one point, that is mechanically equivalent to being mounted at that point. So what we do have here is a virtual pivot point, which is also a very reduced description because I don't say um, you have to orientate your uh, ground reaction force like this and this, or you have to introduce that in the tip talk and just give a scalar number or maybe two numbers, which say here's your point. Let your force point to that point all the time. So it's again a very simple description and combined with the spring mass model now we're going back to the sagittal plane um, we get this walking motion so you see that building it in a model which is based on the bipedal slip leads to a stable periodic motion the model will soon walk down a small step and it stabilizes the pitching motion very well. Okay. Actually, it's quite boring. The ground reaction forces now have a small problem here. There, you never see this large compression in human walking. But um, this is some, this is some uh, bad feature that is inherent from the slip. It's not a, a feature of the UPP. Okay. If you look at the periodic motions and compare this to human experimental data, you see that the ground reaction forces are not matched perfectly. But it's qualitatively good agreement, and also the hip torques are not matched perfectly, but keep in mind that we have a highly reduced model, and actually it's very similar. So, um, we could say we found a nice model that we can use to explain how humans stabilize their pitching motion. So the two uncontrolled um, magnitudes, which is the center of mass motion and the angular momentum, can we explain using templates, at least in walking. And templates are highly reduced mechanical model that can describe human locomotion they can behave human-like, so they are useful for understanding human locomotion. And we have seen in the investigation from Karma that their simplicity allows very generic investigations. Just remember of the prediction from Karma. And this given man, keep in mind that you should not take them too, literal, too literally. And um, you could come up with a different template. Let's say you don't take a linear spring, you take any other leg function it could come with this, up with the same results, I think that also works very well. Okay, so um, for the last slides I'll go over very quickly. It's how can we use templates 
control robots. Because we know the templates can run, and it would be nice if the robot could do the same thing. First of all, trust me, it works. There's a video. Um, this uh, is from the University of Michigan. This robot is actually uh, can run faster. This is just uh, to see it well, works. There's a transition from walking to running. And what this model does, this robot does, is it uh, is controlled using slip. So there's a slip model that uh, says how is this computer, uh, this robot controlled. I don't know who has seen this robot, this uh, robot running before. And the approach is to use um, hybrid zero dynamics. Um, uh, the idea is to find um, smooth mapping from the robot state to the slip state. So the robot has more degrees of freedom, it has internal, um, internal states, and slip is highly reduced. And if you can say, okay, um, my robot has a higher dimensional state space than my robot, then I want to find some restrictions which give me an embedding of slip. So if I, if I say, this is my current state, which is incompatible with my mapping to slip. And then I know this is my error. But if I would not have an error, then I would just follow the slip motion. And um, so we now um, compute an output function of the model. So we have a certain, uh, we have our state. We compute an output, which is essentially this error here. And we develop a controller that drives this output to zero. And the dynamics on this manifold here are the dynamics that are compatible with zero output. And so this is why it's called zero dynamics. There are dynamics, but our output is um, driven to zero. Yeah, and so you have actually two controllers. One controller that um, controls slip, so adjusting the parameters. And um, the second part is a controller that takes care of the dynamics that are incompatible with slip and drives them to zero. And the nice thing is that um, the dynamics that are incompatible with slip can be driven very fast to zero. So this uh, two-step deadbeat rule does not apply to this part of the controller. And um, it's called hybrid zero dynamics because um, there is also a, a discrete mapping from um, um, yeah, the touchdown condition. So you have a, a touchdown, which is usually um, goes uh, with an impact force, which gives you a jump in your state space. And um, this is not necessarily a problem because you can adapt your touchdown uh, position. And when you say, okay, I want to go there in my state space, uh, because this is also again on my slip manifold, and I know that my slip manifold gives me a stable solution, um, you can say, okay, um, I adapt my touchdown parameters that I go there, so that you can actually use your impact for control. So it's not a disturbance anymore. You could use it for control. Yeah, okay, I admit it. This is a very brief overview, but, um, yeah, I have still one more. And um, this is just a um, simulation result from Johannes Bu Oh, this is not my work, it's from Johannes Bulakakis. Sorry for uh, skipping the reference. Here, uh, they just compared um, on a simulation robot uh, slip embedding controller with a reference following controller. So they have a certain reference motion, which is derived from slip. They introduce a disturbance, and here, 
they try to follow that reference motion. Whereas here, they, just, they say, I just compensate the disturbance relative to the slip, which is much smaller, because you also have a disturbance in your face. And if you ignore the slip compatible errors, your disturbance responses are much smaller. So, um, to make a long story short, implementing templates in your robot control can give you a much easier and much more relaxed control. Yeah. That's all I have to say for now, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.